uh, now I want to move on um, to uh, your uh, to Olfactory Art and your Olfactory Art Gallery, um, which is your main priority now. It's called Olfactory Art Keller in New York City. And um, I just wanted to remind our audience that we spoke to Carl Furbake in a previous interview about olfactory art um, and specifically the olfactory art of the Netherlands and we smelled peanut butter and eucalyptus together. Um, so as a prominent piece of the olfactory art industry today, can you explain what olfactory art is uh, to you? I probably can't explain that um, people much smarter than me try to say what art is and what isn't art and it's not an easy line to draw. Um, what I think about it as being important is that people smell something without any utility so you're not smelling it to find out if your milk is still good or has gone bad and without wanting it to be just pretty and pleasant or so not smelling a flower because you enjoy the smell of a flower. So smelling something for any other reason than those two would count as olfactory art for me. So smelling something because you're interested in it, because you're curious about it, because you think it may have a meaning that you're trying to find out these kind of things are the things that make works of all faction art in my mind. Good, uh, good point about not wanting to define what art is. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good uh, start. <laughs> we don't have the time, I guess. <laughs> no, no. And, and also um, the, the types of projects that, that have happened at Olfactory Art Keller, I mean, they're very broad, so very you, you can't define that uh, either. Uh, what is Olfactory Art Keller and what role does it play uh, for Olfactory Art? It, it is a, a commercial art gallery, very small gallery, and I opened it based on two, two motivations. First of all, I got involved in the in the field of, of creatives working with scent and realized that they have no outlet and have big difficulties to showing the results of their work. So galleries and museums don't usually know how to deal with smells, are skeptical and worried about it. Um, and it's very difficult if you create a scent and you find it very interesting to share it with anybody in a institutional way and so I tried to like you know provide a space for that community that I knew existed but is lacking such a space and also an encouragement for artists to work with scent by lowering the entry barrier to doing that and on the more I guess conceptual level um because in my, in my academic work, I always was interested in comparing smell to seeing, comparing olfaction to vision. And I'm interested in the similarities and differences that you find in that comparison. And so the gallery is a space where you can explore that and experiment with it and experience it. So it is in a small gallery neighborhood and I want people to go to all the other galleries and look at art and then they come in my gallery and they have to smell art and I hope that shows them how impoverished a life of vision is and how different it is to smell something and what the challenges and the rewards are to doing that. So that's the, the role that I would like the gallery to play in the art art scene, local art scene that we have here. Yeah, I really like what you said about how it's difficult for all factory artists to find a space where they can actually present their work because they're often very experimental with how they present the smells. And museums are often very, very worried about, about this yeah. presentation and that it'll harm the artworks or, or other people, right? That yeah. people don't want to smell it, it it enters their space uh, and maybe that person doesn't want to smell something uh, like that at that moment. So it, it's, you know, the museum is so traditionally a communal space, which is great. 
Um, but then that sometimes makes it difficult for, um, for certain smells to enter the space as well. So I think it's really nice to have, have your gallery where this is the purpose. Exactly. Yeah. I read about some examples of the art presented in your, your gallery. Uh, do you want to share some of, some of the, some examples of what uh, has been presented? Yeah, sure. I can do that. I, I, I think about the, the exhibitions in, in three different groups. One group I think about as experimental perfumery. So this means creating smells, but smells that you wouldn't be able to sell as a perfume that can't be worn, that are different in what they smell like and what they do from the common smells. And so they can't be they can't be experienced anywhere else in the world. And a lot of perfumers um, have such smells. They came across some mixture that to them is very, very interesting, but that obviously wouldn't be possible to be sold as a perfume. And so like the gallery is an outlet for these experiments some may say failed experiments by the perfumers that are interesting to be shared with people. So um, I have, for example, an upcoming exhibition, which is an open call, um, which has the, the theme of minimalism, minimalist sense. And so I'm going to present in, in this context, it will just be, it will be like going to a perfume store. You have little bottles or little jars that you smell. Um, difference being that the smells you smell are much more diverse than the ones in a perfume store would be. So that's one type of exhibition. The other I like to call scented sculptures or scented paintings or scented art or something like that. So these are multi-sensory works. Um, for example, M. Doherty, the very first exhibition in the gallery was wax sculptures that were scented. The exhibition was called Forest Bath, and it was around 20 sculptures, and each had a different aspect of forest smell. So some would smell like wood, and others would smell like leaves, and others would smell like soil. And so together, the whole room would smell like a forest, but you could also zoom in and pick up an individual sculpture and smell it, and then you would smell the soil or the grass. So it was kind of a you know, a deconstructed forest that could be experienced from a distance as a whole or in detail by zooming in. And so these were an example of those scented sculptures, multisensory artworks. And then there is um, immersive experiences where you enter the gallery and you enter you're inside the artwork now. So the gallery gets filled with sense or a scent. For example, I had an exhibit by a German artist, Camilla Niklas Maurer, all factory. And for that, we filled the space with two smells. In the front, there was a, a smell called young banana. And in the back, there was a smell called old banana. And so there would be a gradient in the gallery and you could walk around from, you know, as the banana ages, throughout the gallery and there was nothing else to look at the gallery was empty and there was nothing to do so the air in the gallery is the is what carries the artwork in those immersive exhibitions that's so interesting how did uh, people respond to that they were very confused <laughs> <laughs> so so these these are definitely the most challenging uh, types of exhibitions to, um, to, to get people to experience. But if I do the, the next one, I'm going to have like very detailed instructions on where to stand and then go five steps forward and stand there. Because if you tell people to just openly explore the air in an empty room, they don't know what to do. They get really awkward and stand around politely and then leave again. So it's very, very difficult when there's no visual markers or anything. I think a lot of people kind of feel they're 
being pranked or you know being part of some experiment they don't want to be part of so i i will i will if i do a, a immersive experience again i'm gonna gonna play around with with very precise instructions of of how you have to experience this work yeah that's something that happens when you use uh smell i think people need a bit of help yeah. uh with the um, or sometimes you don't want to give context but then when yeah. you don't like you yeah. said some can get a little bit confused yeah very yeah. true yeah it's often a, a conflict or like a, a disagreement between me and the artists artists usually want as little instruction as possible and be like people should just experience it but then I as a gallerist know that people experiences mean they look in through the door they don't understand what's going on and then they leave the so most people who come to the gallery they are gallery hopping there's like 40 galleries in walking distance they have three to five minutes for each gallery. So if they come in and it isn't clear what's going on, they just move on to the next gallery. Whereas of course the artist believes that their work is the most interesting one and people happily will spend an hour exploring it, but it's not, not always the reality. Yet it highlights this idea that, well, smell can really engage people like make them uh yeah wake them up um make them raise more um attention in their brain right but then on the other hand if it's not done completely in a way that's kind of semi-structured i would say then you can have the the problem of losing your visitor because they're not used to it. We're all used to just staring, standing and staring at yeah. an artwork, but standing and smelling an artwork becomes very awkward for us. Yes, yeah, that people people are not not used to that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. And it's a difference from from other galleries. Most other galleries, you will go into. And, you know, you know what to do. So you look at the paintings and then you leave. Whereas my gallery, usually when you come in, I will come out and greet you and give you a little explanation of what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, um, like for that, that exhibition I um, mentioned before by Luisa Gottschalk with the paintings that had to be touched was often very difficult to convince people to touch the paintings. One person refused to do it. And, you know, like it, it, nobody would have done it if I wouldn't be there to tell people to do it and encourage them and show them that I do it and these kind of things. So it needs a lot of more guidance and education than a traditional gallery. Yeah, we're very trained not to touch the artworks. So when you're exactly. like, please touch the artworks, everyone is very confused. That, that's what the guy who refused said. He was like, if I touch this, I go to the next one and touch it there and get arrested. So I'm not getting into the habit of touching art now. Mm. Oh, that's really funny. Um, so how, how do you go about choosing artworks for the gallery? Do you have like a a way that you approach um, accepting artworks? There, there isn't a, a, a strict guideline or a process. Um, usually I get proposals and I talk to people who are knowledgeable in the field, what they think about those proposals. And then I usually get to smell some things and then I decide if I want it to be in the gallery or not. But I'm trying to be a very um, large, large tent and include all kinds of smell art. So something that I haven't done before has a good chance of getting picked up. I don't want to repeat myself too much and I don't want to focus on, on specific aspects of, of smell art but try to explore everything that is out there um, and so there is no other than there has to be a smell there's no guidelines in what goes in the gallery and uh, 
I think that's a good, good approach. It's always good to make sure to include lots of different types and be open because especially, I mean, you opened a gallery about olfactory art. I think you have to be quite open in terms of what you choose, right? Yes, it's a small, a small enough community. I mean, one hopes the community grows and then hopefully there will be two different schools of olfactory art that hate each other. And if you have a gallery, you have to pick sides and, you know, the things that happen when a field grows up. But currently it's so small that um, everybody has, has a home at olfactory art gallery. Nice. Uh...